I'm Ali Patterson. On this episode of Fintech Finance, we take a look at cybersecurity and spear phishing. For this, we speak with Anubis Networks, Wells Fargo and Brown Brothers Harriman. Firstly, I sent Doug McKenzie to Portugal to speak with Anubis Networks about dealing with some of the issues in cybersecurity. So within the area that we operate, uh, the financial services are in, on a very particular situation because when it becomes, for example, wh when it comes to email security in general, for financial services they need to do something different from the others, which is they need to look at their own assets and their own people, try to protect their own employees, their own assets. But they also need to have a, a, a big concern about their own customers as well, because they often fell fall victims of, of uh, financial fraud via the use of botnets and, and banking trojans. So this is, this is slightly different from most companies in the way that they not only they need to be concerned about themselves, but they need to be concerned about their customers as well. And this is where, where, where the combination of, of uh, a good threat intelligence solution with a good email protection solution like our product really uh, uh, makes a big difference because for example, if, if uh, the customers of, of a bank are being affected by a specific uh, uh, Trojan that uh, intends to basically steal their money from, from their accounts, having these, the, the knowledge about how these Trojans operate, about how these, opponents, uh, these botnets spread, about who are the victims that are being infected, is really, really important for, for, for a financial institution, not only so that they can create mechanisms to make sure that, that the, the the, the the fraud transactions don't occur, and also there so that they can understand how the botnets how the botnets operate and and who where is the infrastructure so that they can engage with law enforcement uh, in a way that allows them to to take down the, the, their infrastructure so that it doesn't affect their customers. Another interesting way is that is that um, financial institutions also have a huge responsibility in the way that they communicate with with their customers. Uh, particular over email because uh, if if people don't trust email, which which sort of happens nowadays with with so much problems, uh, it's it's also a problem for the banks and it's a problem for their customers. But if 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 financial institutions like like banks uh, use email in a responsible manner, uh, they 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 themselves can serve as a, as a as a way to provide more confidence over the email, uh, and for that they need to employ. You know the the, the the best practices, good standards from from authentication, from or the format of email that you need to send, because if they don't do that, then what happens is that uh, the customer is going to receive a fake email that looks like the bank, and they they will have no problem clicking on it, and that can trigger a whole lot of problems. So th that responsibility of using the email responsibly also falls on 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 the bank, and it's a way to educate their own customers on on using mail securely. I was interested to hear from Mike McGovern from Brown Brothers Harriman around the approach that they take to protecting their customers' data. Right, so obviously cyber is, is of you know, huge concern to everyone in our industry. And you know, as a regulated financial institution, we have to hit a very, very high mark in terms of data security standards and adhere to GDPR and MIFID II and every other you know, uh, acronym that you can think of with respect to data privacy uh, and data security. Um, so what we're doing is investing uh, in technologies that offer that security, in building out more granular security models that support data access entitlement in a way that's fit for purpose and allows us to comply with the, uh, with the appropriate regulation in all the jurisdictions that we do business in. Um, but it's, it's a continuing effort. It's not something that stops you know, when, when one implements a particular model. Uh, we'll continue to evolve, and uh, the goal of all of our uh, most organizations is to stay ahead of the next cyber challenge. Uh, and that is, that is a, a uh, ongoing war, not a battle that can be won. I spoke with Bip and Sani from Wells Fargo to hear about what they're doing to protect their customers' data. Yeah, so I think we've all got a lot of data. All the banks have a lot of data. I think it's trying to understand what's in it, how do we use it, what do we need to use it for. So if you can answer those questions, I think you'll be very clear on what you want to capture in the future. Maybe in the future we need different data sets, not what we've always been capturing. 
in our in our strategy, we're looking at you know a lot of uh, enterprise and technology companies have been talking about data lake strategies, and the idea is to kind of get data in one position where you know you can then leverage the holistic view of your customer and your data sets. You can apply different machine learning algorithms. You can write artificial intelligence algorithms onto it, so you can draw out more value from it. So if I look at that, regulatory point of view also plays a very important role, right? I mean, we are looking, even when we're doing um, artificial intelligence you know, algorithms, we are talking about differential privacy. Uh, we are talking about how do you encrypting data while at rest and while in motion. So from a security point of view, it's, it's like number one priority. There is no other thought around there. There is no other shortcuts around there. So even artificial intelligence algorithms are now beginning to adapt to that because to get access to data, how do, how do you, you know, anonymize the data enough so that you can still get the value out of it, right? And, and then if you look at what's happening in the other algorithmic models where homophobic, you know, homographic uh, uh, algorithms which are being written, which have to be kind of leveraged in the future. So that's how we're looking at it, applying data, but you know, you've got to maintain the security standards and the policies around it, um, because uh, that could be a major showstopper otherwise. You know? And again, from our perspective, if you look at what we've done with our consumer side, right, we've announced some new services in the consumer space around Control Tower. Uh, you know, that is a new, uh, new service offering where consumers have the control of what data and how do they want to manage their instruments with Wells Fargo. So that's something new which we announced in the U.S. We're hoping to get more out of that service to understand our customers' behaviors, what they like, what they don't like. It's a pilot element which is embedded into it. So, you know, as we start from an R&D group, we look at stuff in the POC stage, prototype space, pilot stage, and then take it to production. After hearing about customer data protection issues, I wanted to hear about what happens when a spear phishing attack occurs and how to prevent it. So the spear phishing attacks to mitigate, mitigate them from a technical perspective is really, really hard because if they are well done, as they, as they tend to be more and more recently, the, usually the, the complexity on a, on a well-conducted spare phishing attack is not technical, is, is more social than anything. So it, it means that the, the bad actors go, they, they try to do their reconnaissance phase, they try to understand who, who uh, a lot about their target, who are they dealing with. So it's more of a social uh, aspect to it, where their goal is always to try to send something that it's going to look legit coming from someone they already expect to receive something. And that the sophistication is more on the social aspect of it, and it's really, really, really hard to, to come up with measures to, to fight that. There are, there are, for example, companies that focus, it's not our case, but they focus on, on uh, training, uh, personnel to try to identify the telltales of, of, of this type of attacks. But usually when they do these training sessions, their success rate in terms of actually being able to compromise is nearly 100% because it's really, really hard. If it's well done, it's really, really hard to protect against that. W with our own solutions from, a, from a, a technical perspective, what we do is we try to implement uh, all the, the, the standards and bec best practices in terms of how to properly properly uh, uh, make sure that we can authenticate email messages that are coming in to the to the customer mailbox, so that we we can look at it and say, okay, this message is ca is coming from a company, uh, or it says it's coming from a company, but in reality, the origin of the message isn't really part of that company. It's not it's not authorized to send email in the name of that company. So we use these standards like SPF, DKIM, DMARC to to do this work. And also, the way we try, and it's, it's really hard to educate users, especially for us because we do the technical part. But the, what we try to do is, is incorporate on our, on, our, on our product ways to take the messages so that it can raise a warning to the user if they look suspicious in some way. So it's not about outright blocking them because that sometimes can cause false positives. But sometimes if you just add a warning or a tag or something that, that says maybe this message is spoofed. That's a way that the user can use to, okay, maybe I need to look, look at this in detail and see if it's spoofed or not. And, and by doing that, the users uh, end up training themselves uh, in order to be better protected. What are you guys looking at to do with that vast sea of information to really kind of enhance the customer experience? Well, I, I think of it as the data experience these days uh, that we're seeking to provide our clients. And again, we have been uh, uh, fortunate 
uh, to be granted the opportunity to service our clients' data needs through our infomediary engine. So thousands of transmissions on a daily basis for the leading asset managers and financial institutions on the planet. So our goal is to really act as a general contractor of those, of those data flows and uh, facilitate data transformation, facilitate data provisioning, um, and essentially allow our clients to um, uh, take advantage of that and, and uh, deliver on a, on a spectrum of data needs across different digital channels that we support, whether it be our new portal, our new uh, digital client experience portal, okay. or the uh, new API framework that I mentioned earlier that we implemented that allows provisioning of data uh, directly into clients' uh, business processes or actually automated processes running on servers in their environment in a secure way. So what can we do to protect the information? I think the most important element is uh, to see, uh, to have the right controls within the systems. Um, not giving, and when I, what I mean by that is controls in the sense that uh, access to people or, or access to data to people who really need it, not versus everybody having access to it. That's one way to look at it. Second thing is we've also got to see if there is an, um, you know, a, cust a user or somebody who's in your system who's not authorized, that should be flagged immediately. It should not be that I found out about that two months later, because two months later is very late, because then the damage is already done. So I think from that perspective, the scans into our infrastructure, who has access to what, um, who uh, has access to what, and also what technology set we're running in the forefront, like the web interface or the mobile interface, you know, because the hacks could come in from any channels. It's no more constrained that it can only come through a particular channel. So I think from that perspective, you have to guard yourself in, in a fashion where, um, you know, it's hard to kind of, you know, get the access to the core, right? But in the back end, I would also look at infrastructures where the, the information is also distributed. It's not sitting on one, on one piece of infrastructure, so to say. So you, it's hard for you to construct the complete data set for, from a hacking perspective. So you've got to think about intelligently, how do you split the data, how do you hash the data, how do you encrypt the data, and how do you manage your encryption keys in the long run in the enterprise? Because you know these are important assets and we are protecting our customers here more so than anybody else, and that's very important for us. You can't really. How do you get past that? You can't. It's no, I mean, so long. It, and only we should be able to recreate the data, right? And I think we've got to think about it. How do we use technology and compute power to our advantage there? Because the computer is cheap. Uh, I think that becomes very interesting. Now you can look at different models how you do it. Um, again, we are part of the research group where we're looking at technologies in this space. Uh, working with some research institutes across the globe, ideally, to come up with those models. And that's why I keep going back to your differential privacy, which is so important when you're running algorithmic models, because that's where the leakage could happen, because I could open the data set for you, and you may have access to data, and something could happen. We don't want that. I also wanted to highlight the difference between mail security and threat intelligence in the financial sector. Well, um, email is being, is being uh, used uh, as the main um, actar, act, attack vector uh, when trying to compromise a system or uh, a, a, a user account. While uh, mail thought to be uh, over <laughs> by, this, by this time, and many, many people try to predict the, the death of email, we see an increased use of email over the time. So it is being abused uh, as much as possible to try to get uh, the user to, to do something whether it's to follow a link, uh, open a file, or actually do a, some kind of action like uh, a wire transfer or something like that. And people still rely heavily on, on email to, 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 to perform some th this kind of actions. Can you tell us more in detail about how this helps create a more secure uh, email chain? We actually have, have a system that allows us to create some uh, virtual uh, relationship between uh, senders and receivers. So we know, for instance, that um, uh, a well-used um, exchange of emails between a couple of identities, uh, if, if they occur frequently, you know that that will be a good, a good indicator that the message is good. The opposite, uh, the opposite may raise some f red flags about that specific transaction. The relationship between companies, it's, it's somehow important because if it's used uh, a lot, it can uh, somehow 
create that, uh, that knowledge. So we're starting to see a massive increase. I think it's 90% of um, all current threats are internal now. Um, how do you guys mitigate some of those threats? Yeah, that's one of the, the, one of the problems with spear phishing. I mean, we try to look like an internal uh, person and try to create some, some, some trust over the, the, the other party. Usually, like we said before, uh, we had some mechanisms that try to validate and authenticate mail between parties and try to see to see if they are somehow trustable or really trustable, and, and the users should receive that message clean. In terms of using data and automating processes, do you think that is something that's made everything a lot more secure? Um, I think that there's a dichotomy that the whole industry needs to come to terms with, uh, you know, over time as to uh, the trade-off between security and efficiency. I think we, uh, you know, because of, uh, as a 200-year-old financial institution and as the fintech business within that institution, I like to think of us as the soul of a startup in a, in a mature, uh, successful financial organization. You know, I think we have to balance both needs and uh, our clients, uh, privacy and data security will always come first in that calculus at BBH. On the next episode of Fintech Finance, we take a look at consumer information and how to protect it.